Dr. Moo, Dr. Schreiner, so here, here we go. So the first few questions all have to do with something I think Christians have struggled with for a long time, which is the application of the law to the Christian today. So some of the questions were phrased in these types of ways. Please elaborate on what it means when it says we're not under law but under grace. How does the Mosaic law apply to the Christian? Are we not under the Torah? Please explain. And then a more kind of robust version of this question is what's your view of the reformed three-part division of the law, the ceremonial, moral, civil distinction? What standards are the Gentiles judged by if not the moral law? Should Christians quote, or I'm sorry, should Christians seek to obey the Ten Commandments? And again, the Sabbath plays in. And so are the Ten Commandments the moral law? Is it nine out of the ten if the Sabbath doesn't apply? Any guidance would be helpful. Is that all? That's all. <laughs> first, first question. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I've been asked to start. I apologize for my voice. I hope you can hear me despite the uh, problems I'm having there. Uh, Obviously, good evangelical Christians have historically had quite different views of this matter of the application of the law of Moses in the Christian life. Uh, the Puritans, and a lot of us have inherited a lot of good things from the Puritans and their theology, uh, distinguish between not being under the law as a covenant arrangement and being under the law as a moral guide. They claim that when Paul says we're not under the law, and died to the law and so forth. He says that means we're no longer bound to the law as a covenant that judges our conduct, that condemns us. But they argue that we are still under the law uh, in terms of its moral teaching for us. And in that tradition, the focus was usually on the Decalogue, uh, that the Ten Commandments remained um, uh, as God's eternal moral law, applicable obviously to Christians as well as to Jews. I, I suspect that's the most popular view among contemporary evangelicals. <clears throat> um, and there's a lot to be said for it. A lot of good people hold that view and so forth. Uh, I don't hold that view. Um, and again, this might just be peculiar to me, so don't put too much stock in it perhaps. Um, uh, I take it that Paul is claiming when he talks about dying to the law, not being under the law, that we are not under the direct obligation to obey the law of Moses any longer. Uh, because we are in a new covenant, our law is a new covenant law, not the old covenant law that God gave through Moses for the people of Israel. So a corollary of my view then is that we are not obliged to obey the Ten Commandments as Ten Commandments, as Old Testament law. Uh, however, nine of those ten are repeated in the New Testament scriptures, so in that sense we clearly are obliged to obey at least nine of the commandments of the Decalogue. But we obey them not because they're in the law of Moses, <clears throat> we obey them because they're part now of what I think Paul calls in Romans 6, 2, and uh, 1 Corinthians 9, the law of Christ. Now, I would want to hasten to add that Paul is clear that we also continue to learn a great deal from the Old Testament law. Uh, I, I'm sure Tom is familiar with the book, and you know Brian Rosner as well as I do. Uh, he's written a fine book uh, <clears throat> on this issue in the last few years talking about how Paul appropriates the Old Testament law as continuing wisdom for us. So not as commandments we are under, but as uh, an understanding of God and who he is and how the universe is arranged and we are to find our place in it. In that kind of wisdom mode, the law continues to have uh, significance in those ways. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that answer. I, I think we see things... Uh harmoniously in that in that regard and and therefore therefore I, I think practically where it shows up is one's understanding of the Sabbath which I'll talk about a little bit tomorrow and uh, 
I think Paul himself indicates, though, that we're to respect those who are s still think that the Sabbath uh, should be observed. But if, but if one follows the view that Doug articulated, then the Sabbath is, is not a command that, that Christians are under. And I don't think Sunday is the Sabbath anyway, but um, th that's where the, the traditional reform view is different. It is, they, they hold a Sabbatarian view, and, and probably some of you hold that view, and I have respect for that view, but I, but I don't think that's uh, in accord with what uh, the New Testament teaches. The, the, the one thing I don't think anyone answered in the flurry of questions that you gave us there uh, was the uh, tripartite division mm. of mm. the law, mm. moral, ceremonial, and civil. Again, that, that's, that, that's a long-standing way of thinking about the law. Um, and the, the usual view, again, we've inherited from the Puritans especially, is that uh, the, um, the, the ceremonial law is fulfilled in Christ, or the sacrifice for us. The civil law no longer applies because we no longer have a theocracy, we no longer have a nation like Israel, but that the moral law continues to apply. Um, I think that division and looking at the law can be somewhat helpful, but I think it's very difficult always to figure out what belongs in which category. Uh, we don't have like a red letter Old Testament Bible that gives us the moral law, green for the civil, orange for the ceremonial or something. Uh, and so trying to discern what belongs where is, is not very easy. And I don't see that the New Testament authors uh, operate with that kind of division in which when they say you're not under the law, you could assume them to mean you're not under these parts of the law or something. The evidence we have, Galatians 5, James 2, is that the New Testament authors, like their Jewish compatriots, treated the law as a whole. It's, a, it's an entire single package that you can't just take parts of and leave others. So with one clarification, so would nine of the ten then be, in your opinion, the eternal moral law of God that would have applied even before the giving of the law at Sinai? So even before in the Old Testament, all throughout all of mm -hmm. creation, all throughout, all the way up to the new covenant, would each of the covenants, in a sense, either republish or would that reflect the nine of the ten as the character of God, as the moral moral law in that sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I think they reflect the character of God there. As, as Doug said, I, th I think a helpful way to conceive of this is those nine commandments are part of the law of Christ. How do we know they're part of the law of Christ? Well, we know that because we're, we're told uh, by the New Testament revelation itself. And, and, and I think it is right to infer from that why, that does the text say this directly? I'm not thinking of a text, but why are the nine of those 10 obligatory? Yes, I think they're obligatory because they reflect God's character. Another question. So this individual asked, uh, given a scenario where you were given a few minutes to explain the gospel from the book of Romans, what would you say if you were on a world stage in front of all men in, in a few short sentences? What would be your summary of the gospel from what we've studied over the last few days and we'll be studying tomorrow? Uh, the good news is that God has sent a savior who is Lord of all and that Savior now demands the obedience of all people and is going to establish his kingdom forever. And now in this era, God graciously gives us the opportunity to experience the saving benefits of that reign of the Lord Christ. So I wanna, I wanna talk not just about the offer of salvation, I wanna talk more broadly about uh, God sending Christ as Lord and his program to recapture the entire universe uh, for his glory. Yeah, I'm, and I'm happy with that. I, I think Doug would agree with this. I would want to go on to say what it means to, uh, to submit to that lordship is to uh, confess your sins and, uh, and confess Jesus as Lord and, and put your trust, it's a big theme in Romans, right, in his atoning death. 
you, you, you can't become a member of his kingdom unless you uh, put your faith in, in Jesus' death and resurrection on your behalf. Next, are there any hermeneutical implications based on the truths found in Romans 3, 2 through 3? Remember about the oracles of God? Is that, that text? Is that what we're talking about? The citation is 3, 2 through 3. I don't know exactly what they're wanting to know about that. My thought reading the verse, I'd love to hear what Doug would say, is I think, I think Paul is anticipating here Romans chapter 9, which I just talked about. Our God's saving promises to the Jews, will those promises be fulfilled? Well, when he says some were unfaithful, I think that probably means most were unfaithful. Paul's... Uh, not speaking literally there, will, will that nullify God's saving faithfulness to his people? It, it will not. God will, God, will, God will save his people. So Romans 3 anticipates, I think both Romans 6 and Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 in terms of answering this question regarding God's faithfulness to his promises to uh, his people. Yeah, I, 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 that's certainly a key point, uh, obvious point that Paul makes here. I might just add that maybe God's faithfulness here, as Paul develops it in verses 4 and following, involves his faithfulness to all his promises and warnings. Hmm. Uh, in, in other words, that when God judges his people for their sin, that's evidence of God's faithfulness. Hmm because he was clear from the beginning. I will reward you for obedience and I will punish you for disobedience. So when Jews are disobedient and God punishes them, that's itself a manifestation of his faithfulness. Would you both please elaborate on your view of from faith to faith in 117? Well, I'll just repeat what I said last night. I think that's one where I've changed my view, uh, that I think it's probably from the faith of uh, Jews to the faith of Gentiles, so that there is this uh, emphasis uh, on the inclusion of the Gentiles here that Paul then picks up at the end of chapter three in a similar way. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I haven't, it's been a while actually since I've looked at this phrase in detail. I still hold the emphatic view that it's from faith to first to last, but it's, it's a difficult phrase. I, I remember when I was looking at it, I thought some of the parallels supported the emphatic view, but to be honest, I can't remember those off the top of my head now without, without looking at those. But that, it's a very difficult phrase, hard to be sure, uh, I think, what Paul is saying. Last, or I guess, yes, last night, Dr. Schreiner, you mentioned uh, eternal conscious torment in your lecture on the end of Romans 1 and then all the way through 320. Can both of you comment on whether you both hold to eternal conscious torment and equip the audience with a few arguments for this because the doctrine of hell is under attack today? Well, um, I think, I mean, what, what is a clear text? I think, not in Romans, but I understand the te first text I think of in that regard. I mean, I was thinking, speaking more theologically, but I think in Revelation 14, verse, um, verses 9 and following, where he speaks of worshiping the beast in its image, those who do so receive a mark on the forehead or on the hand. Uh, they will drink the wine of God's wrath, which has poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. 
I mean, I mean, I know some take that to mean the smoke goes up but the punishment ends. I think that's a rather artificial reading. <laughs> I think if the smoke is, is going up, the smoke of their torment is going up, that it's the, the most natural way of reading that is the torment lasts forever and I think that's confirmed by there is no rest, he continues to say, day and night for those who worship the beast and its image or anyone who receives the mark of its name. So I, I think that's a clear text that says that the, the punishment is uh, forever and it involves torment and there's no indication that it ceases. The, the other point I'd like to make is just how that text is used in context. He, he's actually writing the believers, right? And the very next thing he says, I mean, this isn't part of the question, but it's interesting to me, this calls for endurance from the saints who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus. So I think the reason John emphasizes this in context is he wants the community, the churches, to persevere in their faith. And he's saying, look, when you're suffering, it's tough to persevere, but this is what you avoid. Obviously, this isn't the only motivation to persevere, but it is one motivation. Those, those who compromise and side with the beast those who side with uh, those who oppose God, they will suffer forever. So hang on, hang on, persevere, stick with it. It's worth it. It's worth it at the end of the day. There's a great reward coming. And, and uh, so this, we, we ought not to interpret it, this as John is, uh, John is delighting in this kind of punishment for the wicked. He, it's, a, it's a loving warning. <laughs> for the saints, and of course, I, the same, I think, would apply to unbelievers. It's a, it's a, it's a warning of a, of a disaster, and uh, life, is, life is serious, isn't it? And the decisions we make in life are of, of weighty significance and, and um, heaven and hell are at stake. So that, that's just the text that came to my mind. Uh, yes, I, I do think the scripture does teach eternal conscious punishment. I wish it didn't. I wish it was not a view that I had to hold because <coughs> scripture teaches it. I'm uncomfortable with it, uh, but I do think scripture teaches it. Um, Matthew 25, 46 is another verse that we can cite. The conclusion of the sheep and goats story. They will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. So that, that, that contrast or comparison between the positive eternal life and the negative eternal punishment, uh, I think suggests uh, the same idea. So I can understand why some pick up the language of destruction the New Testament uses for the end of unbelievers and conclude from that that annihilationism is the idea. That Ultimately, what happens to unbelievers is that they simply cease to exist. Uh, I, I wish I could hold that view. I prefer that view. Uh, but I don't think, finally, it's what Scripture allows me to conclude uh, is the truth of the matter. Yeah, and, and I think of the, the, the main view in the history of interpretation is eternal conscious uh, torment as well. And, and I, th I think it's helpful to think about the history of interpretation at this point since our culture, at least in my estimation, has an overemphasis on love and tends to denigrate holiness. So I think there uh, our ancestors uh, instruct us and, and warn us about moving in directions that, uh, that fit more with our cultural moment. As a follow-up, would either of you hold that EZT or a, a eternal conscious form that would be an essential doctrine of faith? Or maybe the ramifications of such? Would be what, I'm sorry? An essential, an essential element of the faith. Uh, it depends on what you mean by essential. I mean, I, John Stott didn't hold this teaching. I think John was uh, an evangelical. In our church, uh, you know, we, when we come to local churches, it's part of our statement of faith. In that sense, I think it's a very, a, a very important teaching. I would want to, if I were 
I mean, I'm in a school that demands that, we, that you hold to that doctrine, but I wouldn't say, well, if you deny that doctrine, if John Stott, for example, is an annihilationist, then he's not an evangelical. So. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think the reality of hell is essential. Mm -hmm. I don't think the exact nature of it is. Another question. Um, Someone asks, with so many verses and interpretations being debated on an academic level, how can a lay believer be confident in getting the text right in their regular study of God's word? How can they have the confidence that the Bible itself seems to command? A view that has been, again, fundamental in the history of the church and particularly dear to the Protestant reformers was what we call the perspicuity of scripture. Uh, namely that the ordinary person could pick up scripture and read and understand its basic message. I think we do have to say basic message. Uh, all of us pick up scripture and are puzzled at parts of it, wonder, <coughs> wonder what to do with it, don't understand bits and pieces. Um, uh, and that's um, understandable and again, does not interfere with our ability to grasp the basic message God has for us in his word. Um, scholars, um, um, and, and Tom will agree with this, I know, scholars make their living by creating issues to talk about. Uh, so I would want to distinguish between 70% of the academic work that is, is involved either in outright denials of what scripture pretty clearly teaches uh, or trying to create problems that don't exist and we could ignore that. Um, I'm old enough now that I'm increasingly just ignoring that myself. Um, uh, maybe 30% yeah, are, is dealing with real, real issues that are significant for our reading of the Bible. and. Uh, the degree to which we can you know, profit from that to some degree is helpful, but, it, but again, those, those are not matters where someone is denying key teachings of scripture that are gonna be pretty obvious to people. So I would say, don't get too upset about all of that. Uh, read the Bible, God has promised that by the spirit he's given you, you'll be able to understand, appreciate, and apply it, um, and be involved with a fellowship of other believers uh, where you can learn and have maybe some of your rough edges rubbed off at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would just want to reiterate that, that you, when you're, if, you're, if you're reading the Bible, the main teachings, the main teachings are repeated over and over. You may miss, miss one passage, two passages, but the main teachings are repeated enough, you're, you're gonna see it. Yeah, that doesn't mean you're going to get every single passage right, and as Doug said, there are hard passages. And, and then I, I, the last thing Doug said I think is so important. Be, be, be part of a fellowship where the Bible is taught. Don't, don't, don't be a stubborn individualist that, where you're not learning from others, where you're not being taught by others. I think that's where if I can use a theological word, I think that's where you can go wacko. Uh, you know, if you, if you, you know, you kind of go off by your own and you just start, you start holding strange views that nobody else holds and you become kind of stubborn and... Uh, that's how cults get their start. Yeah, right? yeah. So, you know, you need, you need the fellowship of other believers and yeah, I, I, I agree with Doug. It's the main teachings are clear. All right. How do you both define grace? <clears throat> well, um, yeah. Do, do I have a, a definition? I think I think grace grace is God's gift to us in Jesus Christ. I mean, I think we've seen we see in Romans. God's grace means that salvation doesn't come through human performance, but, uh, but is a, a gift granted to us uh, by God. 
I, I do think in Ephesians, God's grace, God's grace is a gift given to us, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But I also think he argues in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 that grace, grace is a gift, but it's also a power that transforms us. So that God gives us a gift of salvation, which we receive by his grace, by faith you are saved through grace, and that is not of your own, it's a gift of God, not of works that no one should boast. But it's also, he argues in those verses, God's, God's grace has seated you in the heavenlies in Christ. So, and I, and I think this fits with Romans 6 as well, which uh, Doug taught today, God's grace uh, liberates us, so we've di- we're, we've died with Christ. We're new in Christ. So I would I would say the operative words for me in grace are gift and power. It's a gift given to us, and it's a it's a power that also transforms us. And I and at least in my experience, I think one of the mistakes some people make is they think of ga- grace as like a like a present you're given, and then you unwrap it, and that's it. But there's no idea of power in that. It's only the idea of a gift given to you, but it's, I think we should think of gift and power. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's great. Repeat everything to that. And I, I think grace is rooted ultimately in the freedom of God in respect to his creatures as well. So that grace is what we might call not only the natural, but the inevitable way God relates to his created world. He is never in constraint to us. Oh. Uh, he is free always to act as he chooses to act. And so as a result, grace has a gift character, and, and I agree with the power focus too, yeah. Two-part question on Romans 5. First is, does Romans 5 support a creation covenant, or what is historically been called the covenant of works with Adam? And secondarily, one of the current heresies of the day is that um, many people question whether Adam was even a man. Is Romans 5 sufficient to prove the existence of Adam as a man based on the comparison or the, the, the comparison of Adam with Christ in that passage? I don't, I don't think Romans 5 is completely clear on the creation covenant issue. That's an issue I've sort of flopped back and forth on myself. Um, uh, finally, I think Michael Horton has convinced me uh, that, that it's one of these things that you can't find a neat proof text for, but it's something that a lot of different texts of scripture uh, make good sense when you hold to that idea of God entering into a covenant with Adam in the garden. That's, that's the idea of the creation covenant here. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I would call those who deny that Adam was a single human being heresy. Um, um, uh, I think myself that it is difficult to honor the argument of Paul in Romans 5 if Adam was not a single historical figure. Uh, So I I tend to want to hold on to that and then try to deal seriously with the science that, that, that can create problems with that view. And I, I do think that as Christians, we, we, we can't just dismiss the science. Uh, I think we have to listen to what people are telling us about what they're discovering in the natural world and try to integrate that into our biblical view without, of course, erasing the biblical view. We can't allow the science to trump what scripture seems to say. But understanding science can sometimes guide our understanding of what the Bible is saying as well. And I think there is a legitimate input there. Uh, But on the question of Adam, despite some of the scientific challenges to it, I think there there are ways of getting around those. Um, It's hard for me to think Paul's argument in Romans 5 works if Adam was not a historical individual who could have a representative role similar to that of Christ. Yeah, I, I do believe in a creation covenant pretty much for you know some of the same reasons Doug said. I mean, one of my colleagues, uh, Steve Wellam, Peter Gentry, they've written a book on this. I think their arguments uh, are convincing to me, so I, I do see a creation covenant. I think in terms of the historicity of Adam, I would say I think that in my reading is a very serious defection 
I mean, is that, it depends on what you mean by heresy. I, it, it concerns me greatly if someone denies the history of the city of Adam. I think in, from Romans 5 and other texts, that is clear. I think there's, uh, you have Acts 17 as well, uh, where he made uh, human beings from one person. So I think, I think there are, I think there are a lot of theological ramifications if uh, you don't hold to the historicity of Adam, were human beings created good? How did the fall happen? That's a, that's a very significant problem, and you can very quickly end up with God being the one who created evil. Uh, you know, some, some people going down this road, did, did, each, did each branch of, of the human race fall? I mean, I mean where, where did the fall come from? So I think that's a, a very significant problem that calls in the question, uh, the, it can call in the question at least the character of God himself. And, and another, uh, at least ramification, one possible ramification is if there are different origins of the human race, then there could be uh, a scientific basis even for racism. So some races, you, one could argue, are superior to others. But if we believe in one, which I think scripture is clear, we, we're one human race. We all, we all come from Adam. There was a historic fall uh, in, 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 in descent. God created Adam and Eve as good, and they fell. We, we're all the children of Adam and Eve. So I, th I think that's a very fundamental teaching of scripture. Continue on with some of the uh, Romans 1 questions. So can you elaborate on Romans 1, 19 through 20, three parts. What is the kind of knowledge unbelievers have of God through the medium of creation? What is the extent of this knowledge? And can believers now approach creation in theological reflection and come to theological conclusions based on general revelation alone? And if so, how can that aid our interpretation of scripture? Wow. That's a big question. I mean, I'll just say something that, uh, briefly, since I t spoke on those verses and let D Doug elaborate. Well, I think the text says, right, that you know that there's a God and that he's powerful. Perhaps, perhaps that's even the same, same notion. So what, what do unbelievers glean from observing the created order? I take it that, I, I didn't get into this, but I take it that Paul, I, I alluded to this, Paul's not referring to the philosopher here or, or a person who thinks very profoundly. So I think a person with, with, the, with very a minimum in, intelligence gleans, intuits, from the created order that there, that, there, that there is a powerful God. Does it, does it go any further than that? I, I don't, at least I don't think Paul argues any further than that in, in the text. That they, they, understand, they understand that there is, there is a God. I mean, we could go to other texts perhaps and, and re reflect on this. I mean, certainly the first part of Psalm 19 is, is interesting to uh, correlate with Romans chapter one. I, the way I'm understanding the question, at least I don't understand Romans 1 to open the door. I mean, it's an, I'm not trying to arbitrate the, this question entirely, but I, I don't understand Romans 1 to open the door for natural theology. Uh, it depends on what you mean by natural theology, and I'm not saying that there's not any room for it. I, I don't think that's the purpose of Romans chapter 1. That's, that's my point here. Yeah, I, I might just add that I think Paul does suggest also, not in these verses, uh, but the end of Romans 1, that people have a knowledge that, that, that certain sinful actions deserve death. Uh, uh. The conscience of Romans 2 maybe is involved here as well. Uh -huh. So I, I think he has a sense that, yeah, people know at, at some level of their being and at some point in their lives that there is this God that he demands things and that he punishes those who don't go along with what he says in a very general way. Um, can general revelation be the source of truth? I'd like to hear what Tom thinks about that. I, I doubt it by itself. 
Um, I think rather what general revelation helps us is to uh, give us a perspective on the way we interpret certain texts of scripture. Uh, I teach at an institution whose motto is all truth is God's truth. Uh, so that my colleagues in biology and geology and chemistry uh, as they discover things about the way the natural wor world works, that's truth about God and his ways in the universe. Uh, and I think that should, should be integrated into our interpretation of some of these passages of scripture that are debated. They don't trump scripture, but it's one, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, thing that feeds into the way we understand scripture. But general revelation by itself I don't think I would want to base any doctrine on general revelation apart from some scriptural basis. Yeah, I agree with that. We haven't gotten there yet. We'll get there tomorrow. But Romans 13 talks about the Christian being in submission to the governing authorities. Is there ever a reason why a Christian should not follow the rules of the governing authorities? For example, were the founding fathers of this country in sin when they created America seceding from England? I will definitively answer all those issues tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> come, come, back, come back tomorrow. All right. Is Paul's use of salvation language broader than the moment of salvation, or is, or is salvation language just used differently in different contexts? For example, Ephesians 2, 8, by grace you have been saved. I think Doug said something about that, so maybe you want to elaborate on that again. Yeah, just saying that I think it's part of this already not yet aspect of Paul's theology. Some of Paul's teachings are, 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 are tied to the not yet side of things. Some are tied to the already side of things. Salvation is one of those theological ideas that for Paul is both past, present, and future. You know, the, the old saying, we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. That we have to speak in all three of the tenses to do justice to the scope of salvation. But I think that's fundamentally a single thing rather than uh, using the same language to refer to different things. I have, if Romans 3.19 means just to the Jews, why does it say the whole world? Well, that, that verse is disputed, I, and I don't remember if Doug holds the same view I do, but it says, I've got to turn to it, it says, um, I'm reading the CSB, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, or I think in the Greek it's, is it ento, in the realm of the law. So I understand that, not everyone understands it this way. The law, the law speaks particularly to those who are in the realm of the law. I understand that to be the Jews. And, and then I think Paul expands it so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. So I understand the text to say something like this. If God's covenant people are condemned by the law, well then certainly that also applies to those who are, aren't his covenant people. So I, th I think it's an argument by extension. But that, not everyone holds that view. Some people think, yes, those who are in the realm of the law in 19a refer to all people. Mm -hmm. so. I agree with your view. Yeah. I, I, I have gained such tremendous respect for Tom over these last couple days because he keeps agreeing with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is Romans 6 4 referring to water baptism? And if so, what is the proof? I was hoping to avoid that. Did, did you notice I skipped over that? <clears throat> Briefly, debated text, of course. I think it refers to water baptism. I think the key to understanding what Paul is doing here is to understand what uh, a, a, a phenomenon that James Dunn pointed out many years ago, that in the New Testament scripture, faith, repentance, the gift of the Spirit, and water baptism are often treated as a single package. And you can see this especially in the book of Acts, where the apostles were sometimes calling people to believe, sometimes to repent, sometimes to be baptized, 
um, they could vary the, the terminology. It's a, kind of a single event. So that Paul can bring water baptism into the picture in Romans 6 as part of this conversion experience that, of course, is based fundamentally on faith, which Paul has spent so much time talking about. So I don't believe that water baptism in itself is saving, but I do believe that the New Testament authors tend to treat it as part of the broader <coughs> conversion experience, unlike we do sometimes. In, in many of our contexts, we have separated conversion and baptism by water. You come to Christ, that's great, but maybe some years after that, take the next step and be baptized. I, I think in the New Testament perspective, you see this with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Uh, the eunuch comes to faith. Does Philip say now, come back to Jerusalem and enroll in some classes, and then ultimately will baptize you? No, baptize you right here and now as a sign and symbol of your conversion experience. So I think that's why Paul brings baptism in as he does in Romans 6, because it's sort of an outward and visible aspect of what it means to come to Christ. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in fundamental agreement with everything Doug said. I worry about that word <laughs> fundamental. The only, the only you know, maybe, you want, <laughs> maybe you want to come back to me on this. I, th I, I think there c can be a place for, I, I totally agree, in the New Testament they baptized immediately. I think there can be a place for some instruction today before baptism, because after 2,000 years of Christian history, uh, I think, it would, I would put it this way, I think becoming a Christian and getting baptized was a little bit more like a Muslim getting baptized as a Christian today. But I think for people who grew up in Christian countries, they don't always understand there's infant baptism, there's just different kinds of baptism. They don't understand necessarily what they're doing. What does it mean? So I think, I, I think the ideal is to get baptized soon, but I think many people need a, a little bit of instruction now before they're, they're, they're baptized, because, just so they understand it. Speaking of Mr. Dunn that you just mentioned, so with regard to justification and the fact that the new perspective on Paul and N.T. Wright hold to a different view on justification, should we, have, should we read them in a critical light? Should we read them at all? What should we do with them, and especially since N.T. Wright is such a commonly read author today? Well, I would say, yeah, I mean, it, depend, it depends on where you are. I mean, whether you read books like that at all, right? I recognize some of you don't, but if you do read in New Testament and New Testament theology and New Testament commentaries, yeah, you should read Dunn and Wright. They're very instructive and helpful. I, I think N.T. Wright's book, the Resurrection of the Son of God is a fabulous book. I, I love that book and I found it enormously helpful. Many other things that he's written. I, th I think if you plot them, I, th I think it's fair to say you know, Dunn is to the f farther to the left theologically than right. Um, if, if, if you, so they're not exactly at the same place. Right, right I would say, overall is more conservative than, than, than Dunn. Uh, when you, especially when you start talking about critical issues in New Testament studies. I mean, if you read Unity and Diversity, Dunn's book there, on, on, on critical issues, he, on many critical issues, he's quite far from us as, as evangelicals, although I think in, in a very broad sense, I think Dunn is an evangelical. I, I, I would argue, be careful when it comes to their... In, especially Wright, I'm thinking of more than Dunn even. Well, I suppose it's true of both, but be careful of Wright's view of justification. I think there are um, liabilities in his view of justification, but, it's, but he's helpful to read. And, and, and some of the things he says that even about justification, he thinks justification is forensic, I think are, are helpful. Um, let's end with this fun question. Do you believe in the pre-rapture of the church? <laughs> Doug's written on this. I'm not sure, pre-rapture? 
Uh, it was, do you believe in the rapture and then there's like a pre-written okay. in there? So. I believe in the rapture of the church uh, as uh, a transformation of living Christians, preparing them for their, uh, their, their new heaven and new earth existence at the time of Christ's return. Uh, so in traditional categories, I'm a post-tribulationist. And I'm, I agree with Doug, and I just want to commend his essay on it. It's a really helpful essay. If you, if you want to wrestle through this issue, I think it's a, a really outstanding defense of the post-trib view. Of course, we love, we love people who hold uh, different views on that matter. This is certainly not a test of fellowship in any way. But uh, that essay, what's the title of the book? <clears throat> <laughs> Three views of the rapture. On the rapture. Three, Three views, views on, on the, the rapture. rapture. Yeah. So I read that essay very many years ago, and I found it enormously helpful and very clear. So, and it's good to read the whole book. You know, the nice thing about reading a book like that, you get to read all, all three views. Th right. All three views.